Hello, my name is Jackson Coleman and I'm going to be discussing with you some of the theories of accommodation and how the lens changes shape in the human eye to provide far and near vision. We can use ultrasound to give a cross section of the lens. We can see the anterior curvature and the posterior curvature and the zonule not as well as we would like ideally and that's why there are so many different accommodation theories. The accommodation theories really began uh, back in 1801 when Young first described the lens as changing shape to produce far and near vision. Von Helmholtz in 1865 proposed what is still the most widely held theory which relates lens change in shape to a capsular constriction or molding of the lens. He did have others who felt that there were other causes of the lens change in shape that related to vitreous support. Kramer, 1851, Flug, Churning, all proposed that the vitreous was involved. Fincham, who was the major apologist for von Helmholtz in the 1930s, did several experiments relating to uh, spinning the lens to show it could change its anterior curvature and posterior curvature. And this is largely what has uh, held sway with most observers when we discuss accommodation. So the capsular theory is still the main theory. However, as I noted, others have reported and redefined vitreous support as a major portion of accommodation. Our own efforts relate to that same concept of vitreous support. And we have used a model just to demonstrate with no other forces involved called a free body diagram. What is happening with force on the equator of the lens that either stretch the lens and causing the elastic capsule to condense the lens and release causing the lens to round up or with an additional force of vitreous pressure behind the lens changing the vector of forces uh, and allowing the anterior lens to respond differently. The group of people that tend to favor the Helmholtz theory, and Helmholtz was a genius. You have to remember that he's the same man who invented the electrocardiogram and so many other uh, functions, but nevertheless did not have the sophisticated evaluations that we do at present. He did not have ultrasound. He did not have... Uh, OCT, and nor did he have the optical techniques that we present have. Nevertheless, this is a diagram that Dan Goldberg has uh, proposed that demonstrate the difference between the accommodated and the non-accommodated lens, and it relates to pressures from the ciliary body stretching the capsule in the non-accommodated state and with relaxation of the zonule, rounding up the lens. This requires that the capsule have sufficient elasticity. Young's modulus has to be sufficient and it can mold the lens. Many of us believe that this is not really adequate and that the exact reproducible shape of the anterior curvature of the lens really relates to vitreous pressure and support. This can easily be shown with a simple model that accompanies the free body diagram and demonstrates that if we support a lens model, in this case a water-filled balloon, on saran wrap supported by uh, two different uh, pylons, simply by moving the pylons together, which essentially is a model of the constrictive effect of the ciliary body, that we can get exactly the same lens shape of steeper radius of curvature anteriorly, a narrowed cross-sectional diameter, and a thickened front-to-back lens. Now, what are the universally accepted features of the lens and accommodation? First of all, it's incredibly rapid and reproducible and precise, roughly 300 microseconds to go from far to near or near to far. There is a translational movement forward of the lens. The anterior lens surface is paraboloid or uh, catenary, as I will describe in a few moments. The posterior lens surface is relatively unchanged in terms of its curvature. Accommodation can be potentiated by convergence. In other words, using the two eyes together can improve accommodation, particularly when looking at something quite close. 
and this relates to the medial rectus muscle increasing pressure on the vitreous. Also, it's universally accepted that the lens grows with age. Laying down of more uh, fibers in the lens makes it bigger and structurally more rigid. Now, what are some of the disputed features of accommodation? First, is the strength of the ciliary body attachment to the zonule sufficient to round up the lens? And two, as I mentioned before, is the modulus elasticity, Young's modulus, for the capsule adequate to precisely model the anterior lens to a reproducible optical surface? Well, let's talk a minute about vitreous support. Vitreous support is a paper uh, I first published in 1970, which demonstrated that with some medical students here at Columbia accommodating and measuring the front-to-back surface with ultrasound, we could demonstrate that the lens center of mass moved forward. That indicates a translational movement. We would not expect a translational movement of, uh, of capsular theory. Now let's take a moment just to talk about the ciliary body. This is a diagram, a schematic, demonstrating the three main components of the ciliary muscle. There is a sphincter, and there's longitudinal fibers, and there are meridional fibers. Now these tend to provide a shortening of the entire ciliary body along with a constriction which reduces the orifice for the lens. So if we have a model like this uh, demonstrating a shortening of the choroid, which occurs when the longitudinal fibers shorten the length of the ciliary body, then we are going to have a forward movement of the aura, and we are going to have more uh, room in the now constricted orifice of the ciliary body for the lens to produce the anterior conoid shape. This can be shown with a similar model uh, here, also demonstrating the forward movement of the uh, ciliary body and the fact that Weiger's ligament, which is the attachment of the anterior vitreous to the back of the lens, all work as a unit. How can we demonstrate this easily of what is happening with the constriction of the ciliary muscle in the uh, uh, sphincter portion of it? By moving pylons just a little bit closer together, a 5% reduction in diameter, and you can see the major change in the shape of the anterior curvature of the lens. I'll show you in a few moments uh, what this looks like on a living person with a, with a, a accommodation with ultrasound. Now let's talk a little bit about what the catenary diaphragm theory is. It simply means that the anterior lens optical surface is a diaphragm with a catenary shape that is produced by support of the lens from a vitreous aqueous pressure gradient. The lens, zonule, and anterior vitreous function as a diaphragm shaped by the ciliary body contraction and the diameter reduction of the ciliary body. With ciliary body compression of the chamber, pressure in the vitreous is uniformly distributed throughout the sphere of the globe, essentially Pascal's law. It supports the zonule, provides a translational movement of the lens, maintains a posterior lens surface optical shape, and reduces the sphincter opening, which changes the shape of the lens. Now, what does a catenary look like? Well, this is a typical catenary in the San Francisco Bay Bridge. There are other lovely catenaries and bridges around the world, but it is a typical shape that, when you look at the anterior shape of the lens in an ultrasound, you notice the great similarity. Now, if we turn this model upside down and superimpose this on a typical catenary like the San Francisco Bay Bridge, you can see how the exact shape of the catenary is produced uh, in the eye, and it's very simple and elegant. Now, what is the equation for a catenary? The equation is very similar to the parabolic expression that Koretz and Handelman proposed in a series of experiments they did, which shows that the anterior surface of the lens is a steeper radius of curvature and gradually flattens toward the periphery, and this is an aspheric lens, which is what we possess as humans. An aspheric lens gives us greater depth of field. Now, just to be a, going aside just for a moment, 
Uh, Mark Helprin wrote once about what is a catenary and uh, in a winter's tale and uh, he gave this such a marvelous description that I couldn't resist uh, sharing this with you. The real definition of a catenary of course is a suspension of a cable between two pylons and it takes on the shape that we uh, have been describing simply by the weight of that structure between the pylons. Now, the diaphragm and zonular support. Again, if we look at Goldberg's drawing, there is no real evidence for vitreous support, and the relaxation of the zonule in the accommodated state is offset in his concept, again, based largely on many of Marianne and Croft's and um, Paul Kaufman's experiments, demonstrating what is happening in the area around the lens. Now let's talk about that ciliary body attachment. This is a human eye in which I have uh, cut the iris open and cut the ciliary body and then by simply lifting the ciliary body away you can see that the sonular attachment into the vitreous body remains intact. Rowan did a beautiful uh, scanning electron microscopic uh, study of the zonular apparatus in human and monkey eyes. And what you notice is that the zonule passes between the ciliary processes. And the zonule, really, which is shaping the anterior and to some extent the posterior lens surface, passes between the ciliary processes. Very weak attachments. Uh, Rowan described these attachments more elegantly, but they are not as strong as the zonule itself lengthwise. Jean-Marie Perel uh, loaned me this uh, slide demonstrating uh, some uh, microscopic work that they did, again demonstrating that the zonular attachment to the lens passes between the ciliary processes and goes back to the uh, suprachoroidal lamina that uh, Clem McCulloch described way back in 1954. The origin insertion of the zonule is the suprachoroidal lamina going forward to the anterior surface of the uh, lens. If you look at this in a model shape again, if you pull on a piece of tape, it's an attachment to paper lengthwise, it's quite rigid, it can't be moved. But if you lift that paper straight up, which would be the same as the zonule pulling from the ciliary body, it uh, pulls away very easily. Ultrasound can show accessory fibers, again, that uh, parallel to many extents and strengthen the attachment of the uh, zonule to the anterior lens surface. And you can see that they don't even necessarily follow the direct path of the pars plana that the main zonular fibers do. We have ways of improving measurement, really, of the lens using ultrasound. And this is focusing on the focal plane. And we can see a bit of the equator. And again, you see the zonule. But you notice that the zonule passes behind the ciliary processes as well as through it. And so the strength of the zonule is its origin and insertion. Now, a little bit more on this hydraulic suspension. And this is, again, a paper in 1987 for the transactions, the American Ophthalmological Society. And this really talked about the hydraulic suspension. Again, this simply means that the vitreous working uh, with the zonule and lens produce accommodation. Now, at one point, there was a question of whether or not the, the vitreous pressure really changed. And we measured directly vitreous pressure gradient in an adult grade ape, and with that, we were able to show that initially there is a vitreous pressure rise followed by an aqueous pressure spike, and then both of them tend to return quickly to baseline. Now, the point is that if there is an increased pressure in the vitreous, uh, this precipitates and initiates the change in the lens. Now, there have been many other observations, and recently Marianne Croft and Paul Kaufman have been able to do some very nice studies using ultrasound to demonstrate what is happening in this 
perilenticular space. And they have used a uh, particulate or a uh, simply injected uh, some material into the anterior chamber, which enhances ultrasound. And so as the lens changed by stimulation of the anterior westfall nucleus, they could see what is happening to the anterior hyaloid and to Hanover space and the zanio. Now they still maintain that it's a capsular mechanism, but their demonstration that the anterior hyaloid adjacent to the lens moves back makes them feel that it's still a capsular mechanic. However, just because the peripheral hyaloid, anterior hyaloid, moves back does not mean that the center doesn't. In fact, it proves, if the vitreous doesn't change volume, that there is a forward movement of the center around Weigert to ligament that moves the lens forward. Now, other hydraulic theories over the years, I mentioned Kramer, Flug, Leonard Hill in 1920, Lindsay Johnson in 24, all tended to believe in vitreous support all were disproved, or at least felt to be disproved, by movement of the iris that some of them attributed to shaping of the anterior lens as well. So again, if we look at ultrasound and we measure uh, the anterior curvature, the anterior chamber depth, and the radius, here is a image and far vision, and compare that with near vision, and you see the change in depth and the radius of curvature. Again, it changes just a minimal amount in terms of depth, but the radius change is sufficient to provide the accommodated eye. So the congruence of the catenary diaphragm with lens changes of accommodation, um, I think, are quite compelling. The catenary is rapid, re precise, reproducible, vitreous support, explains why the posterior lens surface doesn't change very much. And we all know that the capsule at the back of the lens is, is much thinner than the anterior capsule. And it explains why there's potentiation of accommodation by convergence of the two eyes. And it explains the translational movement forward of the lens. The diaphragm is really a vitreous zonial lens unit. And we have shown the pressure differential between the vitreous and the anterior chamber, which is fluid, that simply moves around the lens as the lens tends to move forward. The hydraulic model also helps us explain the change in the lens with aging. Again, this is the model, a horizontal model with force, uh, with the uh, Helmholtz theory and a catenary model requiring vitreous support. Now, there has been a paper that recently was done comparing accommodation theories with the Coleman and Helmholtz theory with finite element analysis. And this was a marvelous paper done in Germany with Rolf Gutoff and his colleagues. And they showed that when they compared with the finite element analysis model, that there was greater uh, change in the lens with the Helmholtz and the Coleman models. Unfortunately, the model did not use a tangential force as we said that there's a posterior uh, F1 force with vitreous and the catenary model. They simply used the zonular force horizontally in both of these. So therefore, I think that there was a certain intellectual confusion in what they have said. Uh, to quote Abe Lincoln, their facts are right, but their conclusions are wrong. Now let's talk a little bit about presbyopia. Presbyopia is a loss of accommodation with aging. It usually occurs around age 40. Uh, Donders has uh, shown charts demonstrating how the change occurs. And it really reduce, is reduced to a fact that the anterior lens curvature no longer is adequate for near work. And this is treated by using a positive lens and readers, and so it starts about age 40 with a plus a half or plus 0.75 lens, and moves up until age 65 with a two and a half or plus three lens. Now what causes that? Really there are two concepts. We all agree that the lens has grown, and a larger, stiffer lens can no longer be shaped with capsule elasticity, Helmholtz. But it's easily explained also by the catenary theory, 
by a larger lens filling more of the ciliary ring and reducing or flattening the anterior uh, curvature of the lens. We have shown this with a model in a paper with uh, Dr. Fish and what we did is simply fill the lens model, support diaphragm as I described earlier, and as the lens model gets bigger, then the anterior surface flattens simply because of the mass of the lens. And this really relates directly to the, to the dimensions of the ciliary opening, ciliary sphincter, and the length of the zonule. So it's easily explained with both theories, but it's easier in my opinion, to explain it uh, by a direct change in the dimensions of the lens size and the catenary produced by the zonule and anterior lens. Now, how is this important in treating eyes? Well, we can easily do it by adding lenses, but what about after a patient has had the cataract move and accommodating lenses? There has been some evidence that vitreous support can help move the lens slightly forward. This is shown to be adequate, but none of these accommodating lenses have really been able to move sufficiently to completely cure presbyopia in an IOL. There are other types of lenses using Fresnel-type uh, arrangements uh, to increase the accommodation, and these are expensive lenses and still have not been totally perfected, although they are very, very good. Well, let me give a summary. The catenary model using vitreous support of a lens on your diaphragm explains all the features of accommodation better than capsular models. Vitreous support of the lens provides a physiological explanation and justification of some accommodating artificial lenses. I would like to thank uh, my colleagues in the Bioacoustic Research Facility here at the Edward S. Harkness Science Institute, Ronald Silverman, Harriet Lloyd, and Dan Reinstein, who worked with us for many years and is now in London and is doing absolutely fantastic work on evaluating the cornea and evaluating many of the other uh, aberrations that really relate to accommodation. Thank you.